Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Take Back My Brain. I'm your host, Lori Hammer, and I'm really excited today to have Dr. Shane Morris with us. He is, uh, gosh, three de- over three decades in nutrition, PhD in microbiology, uh, biochemistry, certified nutrition specialist, like you name it, Dr. Shane probably has the certification in all these areas. He's amazing. I love his products. Um, if you are a client of mine and you're listening to this, you know that I've been using systemic formulas for a long time. And so Shane has a history there. And then he has a new product line called Alimentum Labs, which before we just started, I was telling him how much I am thoroughly enjoying the Alimentum products and you know, plan to continue to use those in a wide variety of ways. And But we're going to really dive into the gut today, the microbiome, and how it affects the brain. So Dr. Shane, thank you so much for being here. And I'm excited to have this interview. Yeah, I'm excited. And you know, it's it's a pleasure to be here. And it's it's really a privilege to start kind of getting at the messaging out in the most accurate way that that we can. You know, I know there's yeah, there's a lot to say about what everybody knows as the gut brain axis. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some fun researchers uh Dinan and Krinan, who coined the term psychobiotics, which refers okay. to the probiotics that influence the brain. That's awesome. Uh, it's a fun term. You can, you know, psychobiotics. The, the, I like that. I like yeah. That. The interpretation of that term, right? Psychobiotics. Yeah. Is it, you know, is it your fault or is it the psychobiotics fault? You know, right, right. I, I blame, I blame the bugs all the time when I get in trouble. Uh huh. It wasn't me. It that was, was the, the psychobiotics. Like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> I take no accountability. Uh, no, it's I don't fun. Know, we so. go that way, but it really does make a difference, doesn't it? I mean, it makes a difference how your brain functions, your mood, how you view yourself, you know, how you view the world around you. Um, so it, we can't really ignore does. this component. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you can't. And it's becoming every day. You know, I think I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, I started this journey a very long time ago, but, but really diving into the microbiome, I started yeah. in about 2009. Because my background, I did have all of the herbology, all of the biochemistry, but a lot of what I worked on was microbes in order to understand what we call mechanisms. So it's really dry. It's really boring. Uh, If we ever get into mechanisms, I could put you to sleep. It's fascinating (laughs) because that's how you know what's actually going on as opposed to just assuming, you know, A leads to C. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, so it's important for me to get down into that, those weeds, because it, it validates, you know, yeah. certain outcomes, you know, let's say clinically or scientifically, you can, you can understand it. But I got really into that in, you know, 2009. And we just, we just were so excited because there were so many things happening in the wellness world, as well as in the allopathic world that there were just no answers for. I mean, mm-hmm. We didn't have any real answers as to why obesity was rising, and autism was rising, Parkinson's was rising. Um, I mean, you can go on and on, cardiovascular, all these chronic issues that have some component related to the immune system had hit dead ends. Yeah, They, they were not improving. More drugs were coming out. There were a lot of things people were trying mm-hmm. that the numbers on the charts were still on the rise. Yeah. Even in our world where we are attempting to, you know, detoxify and, you know, rebuild antioxidant systems like glutathione, you know, we were getting small wins, individual wins for any given patient, but globally, we were still losing the battle, the, the war, I guess, right? Oh, yeah. That was the only one, but the war wasn't. So when the microbiome came out and when we started looking into it and realized how big of an organ it was in our body. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the kinds of things, they're like a trillion miniature manufacturers. You know, they're manufacturing all kinds of things all kinds of for stuff. us, yeah. right? They're working for us, or if they're not a healthy microbiome, they're working against us. Right. And that was this massive key for me regarding our own body's health. It's like, wait a second, you know, we're working on external, you know, exogenous things. We're working on uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, xenoestrogens, plastics, uh, and and in particular, processed foods, right? We're all Mm -hmm. very aware of these things. 
but some people would say, well, you know, I, I eat this kind of a diet and yet visually they still look relatively healthy. But when you take a sample of their microbiome, when they're on that they're diet, mm -hmm. the, the bugs are all wrong. Their bugs are yeah. living, the kind of bugs they're cultivating are bugs that like processed foods mm -hmm. and the way they process those foods and release things into the bloodstream. They might have, it might not have an immediate impact for a particular individual because they have a very strong liver function or they have a strong right. central nervous function at the time. Whereas you take another patient who's highly sensitive and maybe doesn't have the liver or the neurological health, they get onto these things and these metabolites and they, they become wrecked, right? They mm -hmm. enter inflammation followed by autoimmunity. So there's right. this broad spectrum based on who you are and how you can manage it. And even your age, you know, 20 year olds are highly resilient to mm -hmm. a lot of things, you know, the college diet, et cetera, but there is, there is a consequence. And the first consequence is the microbiota. It changes dramatically if we don't take care of it. And then after the fact, it's, it continually creates things like metabolites that are dangerous and it just right. takes time, right? right? right. Impact our metabolism, our brain, our lungs, and so on. Every organ, you know, every external organ is affected by them, not just the gut. So the first message is micro, the microbiota isn't just about the gut. It's about the entire organ system. It's about all, all of it. Right. Head to toe. Right. I mean, we have, Head we have toe. bugs in our eyes and our ears and our nose. Yep. Yeah. On our skin, exactly. everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it affects our hormones. Um, you know, I'm always talking to women, you know, about hormones and stuff. And I love the fact that you have a hormone uh, probiotic that came out now. Yeah. I know you're doing more things. Um, and I, and I love it. And I, and I took it for a month and I'm like, I do, I do feel better when I, when I took that hormonally, I just, I felt like I had a little more energy. I could tell my gut was just functioning better. I felt a little less bloated, you know, all those kind of things. And I have a fantastic diet. We have a great lifestyle. I've been doing this for years, you know, but there's still those things where, you know, as you age and, you know, some, some things just don't clear up. And I have found through taking your pre and probiotics that I can really, really shift things without having to do extreme protocols or an extended mm -hmm. fast or, you know, other things where I can just do it with, um, and no offense, Shane, your new products taste better than your other ones. <laughs> we were just talking about <laughs> yeah. that before we got on, True. Um, but I was doing it, you know, when you first came out with the like pre pre prebiotics, you know, with the Terra superfood, like that one tasted to me, like, um, like horseradish. And I grew up, you know, grinding horseradish with my grandparents and stuff. And so I was really trying to shift some stuff and I was taking super high doses of that and high doses of the Terra pro or probiotic. And so I was just trying to push and do things and it worked really well. So I was, I'll tell the listeners, I was having a lot of breast pain. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I'm like, I know it's my microbiome. And you didn't have the hormone stuff yet. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to take high doses of this Terra stuff and we're going to see what happens. Yeah. And it worked. It like all my breast pain went away. When I shifted that microbiome, all my breast pain went away. But I like, I couldn't take the Terra superfood anymore for a while because I'm like, I can't drink horseradish anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, <laughs> you came out with your new formula. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it again. I'm like, I was pleasantly surprised. Cause it yeah. doesn't taste like horseradish anymore. Yeah, We, we didn't want to compromise the actual, you know, prebiotic. Yeah. Component. So we, you know, we found pineapple powder, we found peach powder, and those things tend to offset these bitters or these like yeah. horseradish flavors to a degree. I mean, they still, they still sneak in there, but it's much yeah, more. Still a little earthy. So. Yeah. yeah. But I like that about what we do because there's been so many people that advertise and promote a green product mm -hmm. and the vast majority of the ingredients are what we consider the, they're green in nature, but they don't have either the microbiome or the human co component, meaning that uh, it's barley grass or it's just spirulina yeah. or it's mostly yeah. those and very little of these others. And one of our goals in gut health and in systemic health is all your bugs required a variety of food stuff, food items. And that comes from a diversity of plant sources primarily. So if you're just taking a barley spirulina product every day, you're only feeding the organisms that like can that. utilize those two yeah. plants. 
But if you're feeding them 30 to 45, now if you if you rotate through all of our superfoods, there's over a hundred different um, plant-based items in all of those in a rotation. Mm -hmm. And that's ideal. I mean, most most gut health experts or micro, let me say, rephrase that, most microbiome experts want you to have 30 plus plant compounds right. a, a day or a week, right? Depending on how you fit it in. Well, that's really hard to do. I know for me, I can't have 30 different um, plants every single week. I have to oh. supplement with, yeah. Yeah. you know, organic plant, dried plants. And really the only difference is one has moisture, the other one doesn't. And right. that's what powders come into play. And you add back moisture, but it is, it is crucial to, for those organisms to get that diversity and most unwanted organisms, what we call either pathobionts or overgrowing situations in, in the intestines, they don't metabolize these plants very well. They're mm -hmm. much more tuned to sugar, mm. to starch, to these processed food sugars, because they don't have the complexity of the enzymes so it's curious that not only do you help grow the good bugs, you're also reducing the growing ability of bugs you don't want, right? It's a, right. It's, a it's a double benefit, right? You know, it's a dual right. benefit when you do that. Yeah. yeah. So when we're talking about the microbiome, um, and you know, we're talking about prebiotics, probiotics, can you explain the difference? I know one's a food, one's a not, but could you go a little bit more in depth in that? Yeah. What's yeah. So, you know, probiotics are defined as an organism that confers a benefit to the host. So there are a lot of organisms that we're aware of out in the world um, in fermented foods, for example, or in, um, you know, various dairy products mm -hmm. where they use the organism to create a product. So whether it be a yogurt or, you know, um, cream cream cheese or cottage cheese. And then we have the things like kombucha, kimchi, miso. There's These all are relatively well known and they're what we yeah. call fermented foods. And these organisms have a job to do as it relates to those foods. Now we consume these organisms and in some cases they confer a health benefit. So we could say this, this particular kind of fermented food with these kinds of organisms are probiotic in nature. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, marketing people don't ascribe to this specificity. They call everything a probiotic or everything a prebiotic if it has a bug in it or if it has something that a bug could eat. Sure. And what we know through our research and other great research coming out of Stanford and UC Davis and Irvine uh, and other uh, groups in Europe, there is a big difference between a probiotic ferment and just a ferment. There's also a difference between caps encapsulated bugs that have a probiotic benefit right. or not. And really what we do is we target the concept that if it's a probiotic, then it has to have some level of study behind it where it confers a benefit. Okay. And the benefits can range from helping you uh, increase your transit time if you're constipated or help reduce diarrhea. That's a really simple way a probiotic can, can help. Mm -hmm. But then it gets more complex into what we call next generation probiotics, which is where we've differentiated ourselves. And we haven't told the story very well, so I'm glad you asked that because regular probiotics fall under classifications like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, saccharomyces, um, and so on, right? There's just a few uh, what we call um, genuses of organisms that have been around forever. And they were really hatched out of the, the fermented world, right? Most right? probiotics yeah. 20 years ago, we're from the dairy world, yogurt, yep, yep. You know, kefir, et cetera. The next gen are, are organisms that are isolated from humans, healthy humans. And then they're studied for their benefit. What are they doing in us? Mm -hmm. so one, they're adapted to being in us. Whereas anything else you eat from a fermented food or a lot of probiotic supplements, they're what they call transient. They go in, they mm -hmm. help you know, bring in certain metabolisms. They might help create an environment, but then ultimately after 30 to 60 days, you've, you've gotten rid of them. Right. Whereas next gen, they, they can colonize you. Okay. So these organisms that are designed to not only get, go in as a benefit, but they're designed to live in that environment. And that's crucial for some people that have had missing microbes where their yeah. microbes have been lost over this, you know, half a century of, of torture to the microbes. You yeah. know, our antibiotics, our chemicals, our stress, um, and so on and so forth. We all, you know, 
can wrap our mind around that. We can see it every day, but yeah, we do have missing microbes that we want to replenish. And when you replant a microbe, it it encourages the growth of other microbes. So it's a community. It is really a community. Mm-hmm. And start feeding them what we call pro- prebiotics, which are foods designed to feed the microbes, that community starts to thrive. And prebiotics are defined as a microbial accessible um, carbohydrate or max. Okay. And so we can eat, you know, let's say I have a salad. Not everything in the salad is a prebiotic. Many things could be, but a lot of it just becomes undigestible fiber and will show up in the stool later, you know, Mm -hmm. hopefully 24 hours from now. Uh, And yet there are certain carbohydrates in plants that become food for the microbes. And it ranges. So I'm going to use some terms here that, that we use in our prebiotics and we use in science. So we have the carbohydrates or oligosaccharides, Mm -hmm. and those are made up of various sugar molecules. They can be galactose, um, they can be glucose, they can be fructose. They're just linked together in a chain. Mm-hmm. So sh- straight sugar is a disaccharide. And so that chain is only two links long. Right. Fructose is a single um, sugar. It's just a single link. And glucose is another single link. So there's these single saccharides that we see as sweeteners all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the normal sugar sweeteners. And then right. there's what we call an oligosaccharide. So now imagine a chain with anywhere from four to five to 10 linkages long. Okay. Those are the, the oligosaccharides or the polysaccharides that we want to feed our bugs. They prefer these longer chains. And when they metabolize them, we don't metabolize them as sugar. So our glucose, our insulin response, all our metabolic stuff is shielded from that process. And the bugs use these to then turn them into other amazing compounds. That's the main category of of what we call a prebiotic. Okay. The others that exist real quick are going to be harder to talk about um, without some, I don't know, you know, biochemistry, let's say, but there's something called polyphenolics or um, cyanins or Mm -hmm. flavonoids, flavanols. These are compounds found inside of plant tissues that oftentimes give color. Okay. So reds, purples, blues, which is why in our diet, we really enjoy these colors. And it's also why the powders that I have all have a particular color. Mm-hmm. These become compounds that these organisms eat as well. And they turn them into other amazing metabolites that get into our bloodstream and they can affect hormone regulation. They can affect uh, mitochondria. So my, so your yeah. um, metabolism, and they can also be converted into things that affect our endocrine endo neuro um, axis. So the vagal to the yep. gut axis yep. that, that stimulate the brain. They can be converted into molecules that go all the way to the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, all There's just a, a huge number of, of opportunities here to convert a compound that we eat into a very beneficial compound that our body needs. And there's no other way to get it. So without the microbes, we don't mm-hmm. make that. And then we, we may not realize that we're not getting what we need because we don't have the microbes. And that's part of the journey of understanding our microbiota so that when we eat, we get something. Right. And it also can explain why some patients try to change their eating behavior and start getting more of these compounds in, but then have a kind of a, a pushback by their gut. The mm-hmm. gut's like, no, I'm mad at you. I'm going to make a little more gas. I'm not, I'm not metabolizing this food. And that's because the microbes there aren't designed for those. They're designed for eating white bread or, you know, and, and they'll push back and you feel yucky for a while, but that's a transient mode that that'll go, that'll reverse as you change the microbes in your gut. That'll get better and better. Sometimes as short as a few days. Sometimes it takes a week. Yeah. Yeah. So the prebiotic is for the main part, it's mostly these carb structures, but we're now adding to that these polyphenolics, flavonoids, and other compounds. Yeah. I want to swing back to what you said that sometimes it causes distress. So I, you know, I'm sure some people listening are right. My clients will say, I can't take that probiotic because, you know, or I can't take a probiotic because all probiotics I'm so sensitive to and my gut right. just explodes on me. Um, what do you say to that person? All right. I say, okay, let's, let's set that one to the side, you know, put it in the fridge 
and let's try to get your gut in a better position to recolonize and readdress the ecology of that community yeah. because clearly it's not happy. And clearly. really my go-to there right now is you can do what we call the purge protocol where we start off what we with kind of a reduction of organisms. So that's the okay. clear one and two. Yeah. We're reducing organisms. Now, if you want to skip that step, you can jump into the Terra um, biomic and the Terra superfood. And the reason for that is that's the one product I have that is soil-based organisms, yep. which are non-colonizers, but they do go into people's intestines and they start to rearrange that ecosystem. That's what they're good at. That's why we have a relationship with these soil-based organisms, even though they don't live in us permanently. They are transient, but they can set up, they can set the stage. They have the tools to eliminate organisms, bring down the, you know, the, the organisms that have invaded us, um, help cultivate the organisms that are supposed to be there. And they're not doing it through direct metabolism of your food because they are soil-based organisms, right? They, they live off a different, uh, a different set of rules, but they do a phenomenal job at helping us reset our our gut to allow for microbes, good microbes to come back in. So right. they're a crucial step. And mm -hmm. they're also a step that we've kind of eliminated when we've moved away from our, um, you know, growing your own food practices. Yeah. If you grow your own food and you just go out, like, you know, the other weekend I went out and picked a bunch of tomatoes and ate them directly mm -hmm. off the plant. I'm getting SBOs in that moment because yeah. they're everywhere near the plants and the soil. Right. They right. are trained to care with, with the dirt still on with it, all the dirt on it. Yep. Yeah. And so that we've gone away from that. We have all these clean washed food, you know, bleach sometimes those yeah. guys are gone and they did a job. They helped, they helped really manage the ecosystem so right. that you didn't get overgrowth or undergrowth. And then, and then what I do is after that journey, start to slowly at a lower dose, introduce the human probiotics, you know, mm -hmm. the immune neuro or the skin back into the system and that usually prevents the vast majority of those reactions yeah that people yeah. are experiencing along with it. the superfoods yeah yeah no that's so good so let's let's kind of dive into the brain a little bit because we when we started out we were talking about you know our moods and the microbiome yeah. with everything you know i work with neurotransmitters um, so I'm always using amino acid therapy, you know, working with the gut to, you know, make that gut brain access what it needs to be. But let's talk about how the microbiome affects the neurotransmitter production, if you could. Yeah, absolutely. This is kind of a, this is a really new science. And yet we have so much data now because it became, it was thrust into this area of what's going on with the brain. You know, we have a lot of brain issues, cognitive issues, um, ADHD, autism, and so on. We, we know we're having challenges with the brain because the brain's so sensitive to immunological changes as well as environmental changes. Yeah. And these things hap are happening at such a, a young age. You know, it gets you know, younger and younger. So it became a big deal to look at the microbes because one of the main highways of in information transfer is the vagal nerve. Mm -hmm. Now there is a lot of central nervous system nerves that innervate our intestines, but, but truly the vagal nerve it, it's designed. It's, it's purpose is to innervate the intestines and all of the other organs in this, in this digestive cavity and understand what's going on. Right. So it has, there's all kinds of, of enterocytes, endocrine enterocytes lining our gut all the right. way down. And they pick, they sense the type of foods we're eating. They sense the microbes that are there. They sense what the immune system is doing to either relate to that microbe or tell us that it's, it's not a friend, it's yeah. a foe. Um, it's dictating the immune uptake, whether or not we, we want to create a relationship with this bug in terms of it's, you know, this bug helps us support that ecosystem, which then supports all of the metabolites. There's a lot of direct and bi-directional communication between the brain and the gut through the vagal nerve. Yeah. And a lot of that really, there's, there's probably, you know, I, uh, for a fact, there's at least three mechanisms by which the microbes in our gut talk to our brain. Okay. We can do it directly through 
um, creating neurochemicals or neurotransmitters, you know, GABA, mm-hmm. dopamine, epinephrine, they can actually produce these compounds in the gut from things like tyrosine, um, tryptophan, right? They, they have the enzymes to make these neurotransmitters. Mm-hmm. And then they get absorbed in the bloodstream and they send that signal to the tissues as well as to the brain. Right. That's number one. Number two is they make compounds that are in a way, a hormonal based compound, a compound that, that attaches to a hormone receptor on the, let's say the, um, the enteric cell, that's an endocrine entero cell. And that sends a message hormonally to the brain. Okay. So that's route number two. So they can communicate through these hormonal channels. Mm-hmm. And then third is by directly communicating with nerve cells, the, the afferent nerve cells that come from the vagal nerve or the central nervous system by directly communicating with a neurotransmitter to that nerve or wow. another compound that binds to the neurotransmitter receptor. Right. Right. And then the final Close fourth one, which is, yeah. yeah and then the fourth one, which is less understood is the immune system goes into the lumen and, and surveys the microbial community. And there's really cool immune cells. Uh, you know, the, we've got the, the pyre patches in the gut yeah. and there's a lot immune cells there, they can actually survey what's going on in the gut. And then they send a message through the nervous system, uh, giving you an update. All of this is happening unconsciously or subconsciously, right? We don't know this is happening a million times a day. Mm -hmm. And yet when it gets broken, it becomes a real problem. And we do know what's happening, right? We start getting brain fog or even visceral pains or we start seeing our hormones fluctuate because our brain isn't communicating properly from all of these messages coming from the gut. So we know the outcome can be very, very dire. And yet when it's going well, or if it's, it's sub chronic or sub symptomatic, mm-hmm. we don't know what's happening, but it's happening all the time. So our microbes are an important driver of that gut brain axis. Now, how does the brain control the reverse of that? So right. because the brain has the ability to send signals down the vagal nerve or the or hormonally and or through the central nervous system, the that part of the innervation where we say, okay, that those are all receiving information. And yet the brain can send information down to those same cells telling them how to secrete or deal with metabolites, meaning that they can dictate the kind of relationship from our side to the microbes. So each of us has the ability to cultivate that garden Mm -hmm. in the proper way. So let's take an example. If you have, let's say an autism spectrum disorder or a traumatic brain injury, what's one of the first things we notice? We notice that the messaging from the brain to the gut is telling us that we we start to mono eat. We, we have food preferences that are striking, right? Yes. right? We don't want this, that, and the other. We just will eat this. Mm-hmm. So the message from the brain to the gut is saying, I only want this food. And because of that, now we're cultivating very low diversity when we're only, you know, after that injury or after having these diagnoses or, or even comorbid with this diagnosis is my diet needs to be simple. I've become very particular. So there's this, why why is that Shane? Why, why does that happen in the body? Do you know? Yeah. So it's, it's not entirely clear, you know, where it begins now in a traumatic brain injury, it is you injure your brain. And then all of a sudden you start having these, um, the, these predilections for just certain types of food. Right now. Now you're causing the microbiome to change in accordance to the food, right? Because diet changes microbiota. Right. So if you're like, I can only eat cold cereal after this because everything else sounds disgusting or, you know, now you're driving the microbes that love that. And they're reinforcing that by saying, I'm going to help you with your cravings because I'm now getting the food I want. And all of my buddies that were competing for space down there yeah. have gone away because you're eating very few food items right. and I'm winning. All right. And so it's a, once the signal from the brain to the gut changed the microbiota, now the microbiota is being reinforced by that initial signal and is sending signals back to the brain saying, great, I love you because all you're eating is sugar. I'm happy. Mm-hmm. And I no longer have competition from the other trillions of organisms because you're not feeding them. So now I'm, you know, I have a monopoly. 
in something more complicated like um, autism spectrum disorders, ADHD, we're not, you know, there's a, is it the gut first or the brain first? It's not clear. Yeah. You can start it either way. I mean, in, in animal studies, you can start with an animal model that has the um, autism genes or, or some of the genes, or you can trigger autism from the brain physiology and it yeah. affects the microbiota. It Which actually changes the microbiota. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can study humans that have what you, you know, what are starting to look like these spectrum disorder symptoms and you look at their microbiome and it looks very different from a non, from yeah. a normal, you know, spectrum. So is, is I, here's my, my theory and I, I share, it's not just mine, share with other people's, it's probably a little bit of both in these more complicated scenarios. Right. And my biota is changing. Our behaviors are changing. So we're reducing the diversity of our food, which is impacting the gut. And then the gut is sending signal back to keep doing that because we're happy with this kind of food, you know, mm -hmm. the bugs that we've created. I think it's a, a both in many cases. Uh, then you look at something like, let's say um, Parkinson's where we have, what we see are these plaque forming issues yeah. where in the brain are, you know, all, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, yep. MS. Uh, there is some work being done that there are certain microbes I'm going to call them bad microbes, but there's microbes that produce a very similar protein to the amyloid protein. Mm -hmm. And not only do you find it in the gut first. So if you look at someone that is pre-diagnosed with any of those three, you know, cognitive uh, declining or plaque, you know, the, the um, plaque style cognitive declines, you start seeing them in the gut and on the vagal nerve prior to them in the brain. Wow. Okay. So this could be a situation where it actually begins in the gut and eventually makes it to the brain from the gut. And that's kind of the working hypothesis right. at the moment that some of these uh, proteins that we, we look at as, you know, the amyloid plaques, the beta amyloids and others, synucleins, mm -hmm. they could potentially be starting in the gut and right. working. They, they don't fold correctly. And yeah. All exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, and so just kind of, like such an epidemic. I feel uh, with all of that right now, with Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, anxiety, depression, um, you know, neurological conditions are so on the rise. And I'm sure you agree with me. A lot of that has to do with our food systems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the country and all the chemicals and stuff that we use on our food. It's really yeah. hard to find good food unless you are really intentionally buying it from local farmers who do the practices that you want or you're I growing your own food. So I find it really hard to combat. And at the same time, if we have a more diverse microbiome, so if our food is causing some of this, but if we're using things to um, create that more diversity, should we technically be able to handle more within our environment? That's a great question. In fact, I'm so glad you asked it because I may have missed this, but what we've seen and what is being shown in the, you know, in studies, yes. So we have a certain amount of innate ability to handle toxic insults, right? We've, yeah. our ancestors, we, you go way back. We've always had some level of um, exogenous threats, you know, the threats from outside. We've had heavy metals, which are always in the soils that, you know, right. volcanic. And I mean, they're just everywhere. We've always had mold toxins. We've always had other toxins from other organisms. We've been exposed to these things for many, 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 many years, right? right? Our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors. So we have innate abilities, both in the liver, but more importantly, in the gut. There are a lot of microorganisms that are able to destroy toxic things coming in. They just are. And that's because they've been exposed to the same things we have, and they're very, very adaptable, right? Microorganisms live in every niche of the planet you can imagine. There are microorganisms that live in radioactive nuclear power plants. Right, right. yeah. I mean, they can live anywhere. So they're highly adaptive. And that's why we have them because they can adapt to situations and help us under these conditions. So yes, we have these systems. And so even though you know, there's there, there's no way to avoid everything on the planet. We just know that now. It's, right, we it's, can't. Yeah, it's ubiquitous, right? It, it permeates every food stuff, every soil, the air, our clothing. Yeah. It's just everywhere. So what do we do? We support that, those mechanisms, those organisms, those liver enzymes. We support them to help improve the ability to 
detoxify, to create more antioxidants, to reduce yeah. hormonal, um, you know, the, the uh, mimics, you know, all those xenoestrogen things. We, we use our bugs in our, to our benefit. Right. And most of the work that's been done is not just looking at the diversity and the organisms that are there in people that seem to have certain, you know, abilities, but a lot of work's being done on the probiotic side. So you're looking at these probiotics and seeing what kinds of things they can help you with. Right. So in the case they of break like down anxiety, a lot of things. Yeah. They do a lot of things. So the studies on anxiety, cognitive impairment, um, depression, these are these are well documented abilities for probiotics to have. Right? right. These are these are now documented clinically that a lot of the probiotics we use can help you with anxiety by the types of molecules they're helping with. They can help you with things like depression depending on their serotonin dopamine and so yep. on right there we now can use this tool that allows us to help like okay, essentially become more resilient to what is going to be something we're facing on a daily basis right we're right. facing oxidation we're facing these things why not have these bugs in there as first line of defense mm -hmm. um, you know, so bugs are capable of metabolizing uh polymers like phthalates and yep. BPA. So they can help us with the constant exposure to pesticides or plasticizers. Yep. They have yeah. those tools. So we need these bugs at our defense. And they're the first line on our skin. They're the first line of defense in yep. our eyes, in our lungs, and certainly in our gut. Um, you know, urogenital tract is also a really important, oh, gosh, yeah. you know, it's, it, it is, it does now have a link to fertility or infertility. Yep. Um, into, you know, you've seen the recent studies of people that were on, um, you know, the, the hormones to, uh, as a, uh, protectant to getting pregnant. Right. So mm -hmm. people were on those and they met somebody got married. They come off of the, come off of that and they are no longer attracted to their mate. Right. I know it's crazy, <laughs> crazy. And a lot of that has yeah. to do with our microbiota, you know, because yeah. they, they signal to us again, unconsciously, how to best procreate, you know, get, get, have babies and, and who to, you know, how are genetically compatible we are. A lot of that's done by a microbial piece as well, not just our genetics. And, yeah. and it doesn't go without saying that our genetics is designed around in many ways, our microbiota, our genetics help us pick the bugs. When we look at the gut brain axis again, yeah, there's a lot of these you know, neuromodulators, let's call them, that neuromodulate the, the gut flora, but your neuromodulators are slightly different than mine because you're trying to cultivate, cultivate a unique microbiota. Right, compared that's to, so, and it's so your wild. kids get yeah. some of that, but then they have some uniquenesses to them. So, <laughs> you know, looking at the gut brain axis, there is this intimate relationship between the microbes that we need to have there and some of that is dictated by our genetics, who we are and what we might need as a particular individual, you know, a specific individual. When you're, when you're talking about that, I, I think of, you know, couples who they start finishing each other's sentences or they start to kind of look alike yeah. or they start to <laughs> maybe like, I know some of that's environment and just kind of habits that both of you create, but I often wonder if it's not a microbiome sharing that, you know, keeps you in sync with your partner. Yeah, I'd love to say that um, it mostly, it most definitely has a microbiome microbiome component, and I think some of it is because certainly with, in terms of things like pheromones, yes, you know, a lot of those are regulated by the microbiome on the skin, you know, yeah. under the arms, and you know, and a lot all of our body sites have uh, aromas that are both genetic as well as microbiome, and and in particular for women because women have a higher sensitivity to things yeah. like pheromones and, and, and choosing someone they're going to be with because they're the caregivers, right? They, mm -hmm. they give birth to babies and they they want the babies to be in right. an environment. And we that smell is, our babies, you know, just like animals. Right. Do. Like we smell it. Uh -huh. I, I still smell my kids. Yeah, me too. <laughs> they're 18 <laughs> and 25. I'm like, I give them a hug and I'm like, you know, it's my baby, yeah. my baby's smell. They have their own thing. That's right. And so, yeah, you are smelling some of the microbiome. You're smelling some of the, yeah. you know, the genetics to make sure that you're 
your kids go on and do the same thing, right? You want to give them, that's why all the touching and holding and it's, so important. Um, it's so important. You know, we, over the years, the C-sections have become a problem, the non-breastfeeding, the, uh, you know, the, the film that you're born with that, yeah. uh, you're not the meconium, but the, the, I can never say the word it starts with the V, the, yeah. the vermic, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know. that we clean it off for photos. No, don't clean it off. It's the first food for the yeah. bugs that the parents give and the siblings give when they're, when they're holding and kissing and loving up on the baby, right? This is the right. first transfer event that gives them the, that great dose of bugs that the family has carried on for generations. Oh, I know, you right? Break that, you're breaking generational microbiome sharing by doing these things. Yeah, we're, we're yeah. so worried about sterilizing everything, uh -huh. right? And, you know, especially you know, the last few years going through, you know, the world upheaval, um, we were so focused on sterilization and separating and not touching and not talking and not seeing and not being together. And I feel, I mean, there's clearly emotional, spiritual component to that, which affects the microbiome, right? And yeah. we're not sharing anything anymore, you know? That's right. So, yeah. I mean, no yeah, one we, we have... in anxiety and all these weird diseases. I mean, it's contributed to other things as well, but I do think a huge piece of it is the lack of communication with our microbes and with each other and all those things. It's absolutely true because, you know, there's only so many genes we have, right? We only have 23,000 genes in our body that make us up. And a lot of those, you know, like I mentioned, are dedicated to helping you cultivate microbes. Mm -hmm. right? Breast milk is a good example of that. And yet our microbes, when they're healthy, can confer another 2 million genes. Now, 2 million genes can do a lot more work than our 23,000 to help create our environment, to help create our families and our um, health and our interactions with, with nature and the plants and the, and the animals that we keep and all of this, right? This is all navigated real time, thousands and thousands of times a second. And when you, when you sterilize and create these um, really deficits in my, you know, we want to kill everything that we're scared of. It's there's, there's extinction events happening. Um, you know, in, in moms in industrialized nations, they've lost certain bifido bacterium infantis that they first give to their children. Yep. You find every mom in a, in a non-industrialized country has it. When you move into industrialized countries, it's missing. So we're not passing that on. And then that mom can't pass it on to her kids and so on. And we got to change all that by bringing back these microbes. And I like to do it in the term in form of probiotics and prebiotics. Yeah. But I certainly um, am encouraging, you know, lifestyle changes, diet, interactions with animals, you know, unless you have severe allergies or you're frightened. Right. Um, you know, there's a number of ways, but, you know, and being outdoors and being in, like you said, being with people mm -hmm. and being with people in ways that, you know, I'm not a, a hugging and sharing foods, you know, some cultures, there's a big plate in the middle and we all reach in and grab it. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. there's a reason for that because it, we, we used to think it's, oh my gosh, I'm going to get, you know, so-and-so might have some on their hands. If you do it with all of your microbes intact then mm -hmm. pathogens have no chance. The reason right. a pathogen's a problem is because we've taken away all the microbes that defended us. And now there's an opportunity to be afraid of this um, pathogen because we've reduced our ability to defend against it. Yeah. You get back the defense and you're, you're going to be, you know, never sick, never getting sick. You can share, you know, and so on. It, it, it's all of the other pieces that we now don't want to address this this sterilized world that's killing more of our good bugs than the bad yeah now we're afraid of the bad bugs because the defense was already there we just removed it right right sure. yeah we our body was created to do all these amazing things i mean god created all yeah. these bugs to live in cohesiveness you know with us and with the environment and with each other and even the parasites and the fungus and stuff i mean we get so afraid of all that stuff but there there is a cohesiveness that we can come to you know, I just had a young lady, um, she had a colitis episode like a year and a half ago from a parasite and, you know, um, and as her microbiome wasn't good, right. Otherwise she wouldn't yeah. have had that issue. 
And then, so she went a year and a half, she was doing really, really well. And then she swam in a lake and had a pizza. So they're not sure which one was which, um, but she got sick again, with like really uh -huh. bad. Like, like, you know, she ended up in the hospital and, you know, we couldn't really get it stopped. So, um, but again, she was doing really well. So that's kind of deceiving, right? Cause you're like, okay, I'm still playing sports. She's really young, you know, all these things. And she can like eat more foods now and she's doing really well, but we still have this bad exposure to whatever this, you know, parasite or yeah. whatever you want to call it was and it sent her in a tailspin again so that just tells us that her microbiome wasn't up to par where it needs to be and it does take a while to to shift that so can you address that uh, like like how how do we continuously keep our microbiome healthy yeah that's a great one because one of the things that we designed into at least our program and and it includes you know all the lifestyle pieces sure. um you, you it is a journey because we've spent multiple generations reducing microbes in our environment and in and us so to bring that back you know the my program is the pre's and pros but you'll notice i don't just have one or two i have many because the idea is introduce one month and then rotate to the next month then rotate the mm -hmm. next month and and then after you start because the results could come as early as one month or it might take some people three months okay. And results, as you mentioned, can be a bit deceiving because you feel better. You're able to, you know, manage good food better. You're able to fill the energy uptick and the cognitive. And you, you're, you have all these symptoms that are getting so much better. And yet you're still on a bit of a slippery slope because it wouldn't take much to slide back down until you keep that going. Uh, you know, there, I'm going to say that it's, I mean, it's a lifelong journey. But in terms of really focusing on the diversity and the um, gut centric formulas, you know, you're looking at a year of rotation. And then after that, it's maintenance because right. a lot of the maintenance can then be diet, you know, don't get exposed to things that we know are problematic. You know, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to pick on any industry that gets mad at me, but <laughs> We don't need to take an antibiotic if we're just, if we just have a cold or the sniffles right. or, you know, a runny nose, these are things the microbes will overcome. It just might take three, four days. These are the kinds of things we don't want to just rush into as yeah. we're navigating this. Well, we see allergies, yeah. You know? yeah. Everybody gets an allergy. It's like, oh my gosh, I got to deal. No, let's, let's decrease the exposure and then slowly introduce. And, and I'm talking severe allergies because that's treated differently, but sensitivities, for example, Yep. You know, if you have sensitivities to everything, we need to start exposing ourselves as we're building our gut to these sensitivities and our gut will adapt. There are microbes that can attack the sensitivity before your body even sees it. And now your immune system doesn't come alarmed. And now you don't have the sensitivity. You right. know, it, it starts with low dosing and then moving upwards. Uh, but you're right. It can take up to a year and then it's maintenance after that. Yeah. You know, another component of that's genetics. And we do, you know, we are going to be starting the genetics panel and that just gives you insights into what you might need to be conscientious about for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not you're really designed to metabolize lipids or, you know, what does your microbiome look like just from a genetic standpoint? Um, how well would you handle a keto or carnivore uh, temporary diet? You know, cause all these yeah. diet fads, there are, a, there's a place and a time, but we want to get back to a much more diverse yeah. end game, but yeah. there's certainly value in simplifying upfront yeah. so that we can really dial down all the problematic things and then slowly build back the strength. So right. it's true. Yeah. You know, and, and real quick back to your brain though, we talked about all the benefits of the gut brain axis, but conversely, what makes these things so much more insidious, these gut brain interactions is when you have the wrong microbes producing the wrong metabolites, um, you know, everybody is worried. I worry about this too. We're all worried about our exposure to what's in our drinking water, what's in our soil, what's in our food. Right. right. Um, you know, what's in our, you know, if you're going to cheat and have a processed food, you know, it's going to happen, right? There's mm -hmm. always a time where you just, you don't want that to be the, the, the wrecking no. ball for you. You want to be able to manage it. You have this because you're traveling and you're starving and you've just had a, you know, a, an event or something. Yep. It should be fine right? Those kinds of exposures should be absolutely normal and fine. It's the long game in the gut brain axis that I'm worried about it. If, if you aren't getting your gut better, then the microbes that we know inhabit people 
that have a dysbiotic gut, a gut full of microbes that we don't like, yeah. they become manufacturing plants for toxins. Mm -hmm. So the converse is, isn't just, so the argument isn't just get your gut health and that'll help your gut brain. If you don't get it better, the microbes there are giving you a constant amount of toxin input. Not the one time you went to a fast food restaurant, not the one time you had a cheat. These microbes are producing these compounds every day, 24 hours a day, which right. becomes really problematic to the gut brain axis. So that's why we want the gut better mm -hmm. because the gut becomes a constant source of problem, not just an occasional source of problem. It's there and it's doing it all the time. That's the danger of it, which is why we're seeing, you know, immunological issues, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, yeah. all the cognitive things you and I have spoken about. These are, these are driven worse by having a gut that's producing toxins 24 hours a day. Yeah. And I, I love that you brought that up too, because people just don't really understand how important a healthy gut is and that we no. really have to take a look at every aspect of our life, you know, our food, what we're putting on our body, what water we're drinking, because all that affects our microbiome, right? That's right. And so, when, but when we get our microbiome, you know, healthy where it should be, you know, then you you don't have to have that, you know, so many people have such anxiety about toxins and things. And right. you know, sometimes you have to be over the top in order to get That's well, right. um, but you should be able to relax, like you're saying, and, and to, right. you know, go have a pizza with somebody right. and be okay with it. And, and it doesn't wreck you. Cool, right? yeah. It doesn't wreck because you, you and the... you come back home and live your healthy lifestyle. That's right. You have the tools to manage these things. And it's not unlike any other um, culture or uh, civilization over time, right? There's these yeah. cheap things, you know, they used to gorge themselves on honey and things when they found it, or, you know, it's, we should be able to manage these things nicely when your gut is healthy. Yeah. Uh, and even with the toxin levels, when your gut is healthy, it's a one-time event that your, your gut can manage. But again, those, if you have a gut full of bad microbes, you're living in a toxic environment and you don't even know it. So right. all these other things we worry about should be secondary to worrying about the, the manufacturing inside. plant inside you that's producing all kinds of toxins yeah. every day. Yeah. Yeah. All day long. All day long. Yep. And then we're like, why do I keep having anxiety? Right. Changing yeah. this, changing that, changing this, changing that. But if you haven't shifted your microbiome, you know, we can give you yeah, all the supplements in the world and make, you know, some difference, but we have to get to the root cause, shift the microbiome right. and, then, you know, get the toxins out. Yeah. That's truly, that's truly the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Any parting words you want to share? Um, no, just thanks for having me. And I love talking about bugs and yeah, I could talk about bugs all day. Genetics. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, I hope that, you know, we talk again and that everybody that, that gets to see this comes away with an actionable, you know, plan at least, because I don't like just to be information. I like to set up the information, but then help people do something about it. What and is the is one thing that you would say, go out and do this right now? I would say, okay, so I'm biased because I love products, right? That I love that right. way to intervene. Diet, everybody talks about. Avoiding toxins, everybody talks about. What I would say is we developed the Alimentum line to change microbiota, to change the composition and to really allow the move forward from everything we've done. So mm -hmm. including something like a pre and a pro is critical to the change. Cause I know everybody in it, in this industrialized world has a lacking microbiome, right? We just know that we we've done enough tests. There's been a lot of universities do it. We don't have the microbiome we, our ancestors had or even our great grandparents had. Oh, yeah. We got to get back to that. And how do we do that? We start off by just giving it a chance to get to see new bugs, to feel new bugs. And I guess my, the other side of me, you know, the emotional side of me would say, spend as much time as you can in nature with the people you love. Yep. And don't be afraid to, you know, share drinks, sandwiches, you know, um, kiss people on the forehead. What, I mean, it, it's just a way to share that, those bugs. And it's important. It really is important really important. That's awesome, Shane. Thank you so much. I appreciate your wisdom and all your knowledge and just sharing with my audience. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening and God bless each and every one of you. And I will see you in the next episode.